Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is the critical barrier to civil war settlement. And the big question for this lecture is, what resolves the civil war settlement commitment problem? Remember that in the last lecture, we saw that only one in five civil wars end in negotiated settlement, whereas four in five end in absolute military defeat of one party. So we want to understand what makes this one in five different from that other four in five. Now, a political scientist named Barbara Walter, that's Walter without the S, not Barbara Walters, the media personality from New York City, this Barbara Walter political scientist looked through all of these civil wars that end the negotiated settlement, and what she found was that these civil wars very frequently have something in common, and that thing in common is third-party enforcement. And so this led her to write the article, The Critical Barrier to Civil War Settlement, which makes the argument that a third party is really critical, in fact, to negotiated settlements of civil wars. And the reason that a third party is useful here is that the third party, uh, the third party can monitor and enforce the treaty. So what's going on is that if the government steps out of line, which is what you would expect to happen under the commitment problem story, once the rebels give up their arms, the government is supposed to exploit them. If there's a third party out there that's patrolling the streets and protecting the rebels, then if the government does step out of line, the third party can come in and militarily enforce the terms of the treaty which the government had originally promised. And so the government knows this, and this is going to deter the government from exploiting the vulnerable surrendering group because they know if they try to exploit the surrendering group, they're just going to end up in a conflict with the third party enforcer. Now, Walter is very careful to note that you can't just get any random third-party enforcer out there to ensure that a peace treaty works. I can't just go fly to a random civil war-prone region and say, hey, I'm here, I'm your third-party enforcer, and now we're going to have peace. It actually requires a few qualities in a third-party enforcer to make sure that the third-party enforcer will work. And those three qualities are having an interest in the peace, being militarily competent, which I personally am not, and for that third-party enforcer to send a costly signal to the parties. So let's go through these qualities one by one here. So interest in the peace. What is that? Well, enforcers only work if they actually care about what's going on here, because if they don't care about what's going on here, if the government were to try to challenge them, then the third party would just run away. And if the third party is just going to run away, if the government tries to exploit the surrendering rebels, then this is not going to stop this, uh, the government from exploiting the rebels, and you end up in the commitment problem just like you were before. It's as though the third party wasn't even there, because if the third party isn't going to enforce anything, it's hardly right to call them a third party enforcer. And so you can think about this in terms of like the United States and Somalia, where, you know, the United States is this big bad dude, but we didn't really care what was going on in Somalia in 1993. If you've seen the film Black Hawk Down, the film is actually based off of the Battle of Mogadishu, where the United States goes in and has a few casualties. And this causes a huge backlash back at home in the United States, where people in the United States are wondering what the heck are we even doing in Somalia? If you have a situation like that where one side just doesn't care, then that side can't actually do anything forceful to ensure that a peace treaty can work out. And that being the case, you're not going to see negotiated settlement, you're going to see continued conflict. Now, a couple of things that will give you a, a good third-party enforcer who's actually willing to go in and fight is to have an economic self-interest that you actually benefit for some reason from having a peaceful country because this peaceful country can get back to trading with you if you are a big trading partner, or if you are an old colonial uh, uh, power, and so if you're like Great Britain or something like that, and you have a bunch of colonies, and this is one of your old colonies, you have some sort of tie to it that's going to, to give you a good reason to intervene as a third-party enforcer. So you need to have some sort of reason, an economic self-interest and old colonial ties are a, a good reason to actually want to intervene. The second thing is to be militarily competent. This is why I personally can't go in and stop a civil war from happening because everyone knows that I by myself am not enough to stop the civil war. I am just one man. So if the government can really kick your third party enforcer's butt, then the third party enforcer isn't very powerful and it's not going to be able to stop the government from exploiting the rebels. And so this in turn is going to mean that the rebels aren't going to be surrendering. So if you're going to have a good third party enforcer, you need him to be enforcing and you need him to be the big strong bully on the block or at least big and strong relative to the government at hand. And if you don't have that, then you don't have a good enforcer. And if you don't have a good enforcer, you don't have peaceful settlement.
Now, the last situation or the last thing that you need here is a costly signal. And what this costly signal is meant to demonstrate is the commitment of that third party enforcer to actually maintaining the peace. And this commitment, this sign of commitment from the third party is supposed to inform both of the other guys, the rebel group and the government, that the third party means business and will, in fact, step in there and ensure the terms of the settlement. And you can think about it, think about it just in terms of, of these two guys. You have one and two, state one, state two. Who would you rather have defend you if you were that rebel group who was going and surrendering? Would you rather have third party enforcer number one who says, we are willing to enforce this peace treaty and to prove it, we've dispatched 100 observers to your country? Or third party enforcer number two who says we are willing to enforce this peace treaty and to prove it we have dispatched 10,000 dudes with semi-automatic assault rifles now never mind the fact that the hundred observers aren't militarily strong compared to the 10,000 dudes the sheer number of guys between these two is really important because if you get a message like that from number one having them only sending a hundred observers to your country isn't really a sign or a demonstration that they care very much if they cared you would expect them to send a whole a lot of guys, not just a hundred dudes. And so this message that you're getting from number one is, yeah, we kind of care, but we don't really, really, really care. And if you're a rebel group and you're worried about just being completely massacred by the other side and exterminated, then having this, yeah, we kind of care sort of message like state one is giving is not very good. Compare that to state two, who's dispatching tons and tons of guys. The tons and tons of guys means that, hey, these guys really mean business. That third party is really willing to step in and enforce the terms of the treaty and to display that they've actually put out a whole bunch of dudes. This is a really costly signal that they're sending because it costs a lot of money just to station those 10,000 guys there and, and have them ready to defend the treaty. And so having that message conveys to you as the rebel group that the third party is willing to do what it takes to stop the violence. And that being the case, that gives you the good feelings and the assurance that you can surrender without any serious concern that the government is going to exploit you while the third party just stands there and watches. So what we've seen here, what we've learned, hopefully, is that a third party can monitor and enforce a treaty, and this is going to stop the commitment problem logic from going all the way through and forcing the states to fight until, or rather, forcing the sides, the rebel group and the government, to fight until one side has been completely militarily defeated. Now, the message or the lesson here that you might want to learn is that, yeah, having a third party is great, and we should be looking for third parties to settle uh, civil wars, so insurgency stop, and this leads, uh, this stops the bad sort of spillover effects that, you know, terror terrorism starts forming and insurgent groups start committing acts of terrorism and that sort of bad stuff. Unfortunately, the big problem is that you can't always find a third party that meets the three requirements that we just brought up. And if you don't have a third party that has those three requirements or has those three qualities, then essentially you have a, worth, a worthless third party and you don't have anyone who's actually going to stop the civil war. So it's easy to get a civil war to stop comparatively once you've found a third party. It's not very easy to find that third party. And so this is why a lot of civil wars do, in fact, continue going and going and going and going because no one is willing to just step in there and do what it takes to get a negotiated settlement to happen. Okay, so that wraps up this lecture on the critical barrier to civil war settlement, and we will do one more lecture wrapping up this unit on terrorism, and I hope to see you then. Take care.